أحسن So, um, once again, welcome everyone. Uh, thank you so much for attending this workshop. We are very excited to have you here and teach you something about SQL. Um, again, as for our agenda, we're briefly gonna cover the theory about database management systems and what SQL is. Then we're gonna cover the basic SQL syntax. Um, using our PJ admin query tool, so query editor. This will be more of a practical part. And um, then we're gonna move forward with special topics, specifically uh, when analyzing financial data, which will take up most of the session. And then we're gonna uh, take the last 10 minutes to play Kahoot, and we're gonna determine three winners who will be yeah, who will win the $25 gift cards? Let's get started. So, um, yeah, I'm sure by now or um, the next couple of minutes that you take, you will be able to um, use PostgreSQL 15. And you will be able to do that through the PG Admin app. And uh, hopefully, also, you have downloaded the data set that we're going to use for the basic SQL syntax. Also, uh, on the side notes, um, for the Kahoot part, we will be only testing uh, the basic SQL syntax and the theory because we advertise this event as beginner friendly. So everyone should have a chance to win the gift cards. Um, we're not going to test you on special topics because it's just to show you the capabilities of SQL. And let's get started with introductory concepts. So what is database management systems? It's a software package for creating and managing databases. And for today's session, we're going to use Postgres, which is open source. And it's great. Um, it's also used by Baruch. There are, of course, other database management systems, such as Oracle, MySQL, and yeah, um, those are different in, oh, excuse me. Those are, those are different, for example, in ownership. So some are open source, some are proprietary. And um, they are also, they also differ in um, their, the ways that they can be integrated with other systems. And the syntax is also slightly different. Next. So um, SQL stands for Structured Query Language, and it is used to communicate with relational databases. And relational databases are basically a set of tables that are connected. And the tables are just like regular tables with um, predefined schema. And SQL is used to store, manipulate, and retrieve data. And while there is um, big data, and it is like an emerging technology, and sometimes NoSQL or non-relational databases are better to use um, for like larger data sets, uh, SQL for relational databases is still widely used due to its convenience. And yeah. So an example would be PostgreSQL. It's a lightweight and open source relational database management systems, which we're gonna use today. Next, uh, SQL databases are relational databases, once again, and they require predefined schema. So um, within SQL, there are different languages. The data definition language um, defines the schema of the table. So before um, loading, data into a table or creating a table, we need to define the characteristics of each record and most importantly, the field data type, which we're gonna discuss soon, and the length of the values that are permitted in each column, and also the relationship among records. So the most important is defining the data type of each column and specifying that the column exists and its name. 
Then there is also data manipulation language, which provides the data manipulation techniques like selection, insertion, deletion, updating, modification, replacement, and um, other operations. Yeah, and those are the different data types that I talked about. Um, it is important to kind of get an understanding as to what they are, because we're gonna use them definitely. Um, so there are different data types. One data type would be a string, and there are different keywords to um, characterize a string. For example, a varchar would be a variable length string. Um, so yeah, uh, it could be a combination of letters and numbers, and it goes up to 256 characters. Char is always of fixed length, so it's the same, but it's a fixed length um, value. And text holds longer strings, so the text keyword would um, hold, oh, sorry, um, my internet is slower than usual. So the text keyword would hold longer strings than, for example, var chart. There are also numeric data types, which is important in when we want to, um, for example, compute, make computations on columns. So there is um, integers, and here are the words for uh, the keywords for integers. So int, small int, big int, and they differ in the range of the values that they hold. Then there is also float and decimal, which defines numbers that have a decimal. Yeah, and an example would be like 3.7. And the last one is logical. So this contains booleans, time, stamp, time stamps, date time, dates, and times. And it will be important, specifically the timestamps and the dates um, for our special topics section. But yeah, um, and a Boolean holds true or false values. And the last theoretical concept I want to introduce to you is query optimization. So actually when you are executing a SQL command, and this is an example of this is an example of like a simple SQL query. It has um, the highlighted um, words and keywords um, that indicate statements or clauses. And when you are executing a SQL command, the relational database management determines the best way to carry out your request. And the SQL engine figures out how to interpret the task and the metrics that are used to determine query efficiency are CPU cycles and the number of in and out operations. In and out operations are um, basically basically a step by step breakdown of what the database needs to do to run your query. So it's what's happening um, in the backend, basically. And an execution plan may vary in the order of operations and also the algorithm used for table joins. For example, some joins are more um, efficient than others. Uh, the most, in my opinion, the most inefficient one would be the cross join. We're going to discuss this later. Um, and other operations such as nested loops and hash joins, which we're not going to cover in today's session. And also, um, an execution plan may also vary in data retrieval methods. So if you use indices to um, read from the database, it will be actually faster. But this is out of scope again. Um, yeah. And in this simple query, for example, um, what the computer will execute would be, so the first step what the computer would, uh, what the database management systems would look at is the from statement, which determines um, 
the table which uh, the which it needs to look at and which it needs to retrieve data from. Um, then it would filter rows based on the specified condition in the where clause. So it would, um, yeah, it would just filter rows based on any condition that we put there. And afterwards, the last step for this specific query would be displaying um, specified columns. So as a result, we will get ticker, title, sector, and revenues from the data set that meet this condition. And this, this was the theory. Um, let me quickly check in on you and see. Yeah, um, is anyone having trouble starting PG Admin? Okay, I'm gonna start it from my machine then. Okay, and one thing for um, Postgres, you need to remember your password. Yeah. Cool, so um, we're gonna navigate. So to get started with Postgres, we're gonna navigate towards servers. Um, then we're gonna connect to the server that is on our local machine. Yeah, and here it is, we are connected and we're gonna to navigate towards databases and then schemas. And here we have all of our attributes and here we have our tables. But before that, um, there are, yeah, there's one key thing that we need to do. So yeah, uh, we're gonna to navigate towards file preferences, and then we're gonna select binary paths under paths. And we need to make sure that, oh, oh great, Ari posted a sign-in sheet in uh, the chat, but um, this is an important part that will help you throw it along uh, with us. So fill, uh, fill the sign-in sheet out, uh, at your convenience, but this is important. So we in our binary path, we're gonna navigate towards database server Postgres 15. And then we're gonna select um, from program files or like wherever you downloaded the uh, Postgres, I downloaded to program files and you select Postgres, the version, and you select the bin and you select this folder. And yeah, now everything is set up and you save it. For me, it's already saved. Yeah, just make sure you have this because it will need to use these components to, for example, import data or um, do other operations. Cool. Um, now that we have this ready, we're gonna right click on schemas, for example, and select query tool. And here's our query editor. Um, for me, I already have my queries saved, but Ari is gonna, Ari is actually gonna post the queries that I'm gonna run on my machine to the chat. So, yeah, you just have to copy and paste to your own query editor. I have a question, if you yeah. don't mind. I, I didn't, because I'm still on the um, the beginning page where I asked you to add a new server. I didn't quite catch what server you said to go on. 
Um, this one, you just click on it, I guess. You just expand it. Yeah, when I did that, nothing, there was no drop down menu. Oh, okay. Um, hmm. Would you be able to create a server? It says I can add a new server. Yeah, um, try that. Okay, and then like it just asks me like what name to name it. Yeah, just um, Postgres, like any name actually, my server. Did it work? Um, honestly, no. I don't know why, but I'll probably just watch the recorded lesson later. Okay, um, definitely, but still, um, please do pay attention to the basic um, part of this workshop because we still want you to do the Kahoot part and be able to win the gift card, okay? Thank you. Um, yeah, and definitely watch the recording. If you have any questions, also, you can put your questions in our Discord chat. We are very responsive if you have any technical difficulties. So um, let's get started with the basics. First, um, using data definition language, we have to create an empty table um, for our data set so that we can load the data set. And we're gonna, um, yeah, we're gonna run this query right here for this. So what this query does is, and you need to highlight the query that you're gonna run. Okay, now it's um, C query return successfully. So what this query does is it creates the table with this table name. So uh, when we navigate towards tables and click refresh, here we have our table. Fortune 500, so this is the name. And within brackets, we specify column names, its data type, and any constraints that we want to put, uh, like apply to the field. So for example, the rank of the company in the Fortune 500 would be an integer. It would also be not null because we don't want null values in the rank field. Additionally, the title column, it's gonna be bar char because it's the title of the company is basically a string or like a text. And yeah. Uh, what's and, real and numeric? Yeah, so numeric is what we discussed before. It is a numeric data type and it is actually similar to float. It gives you decimal numbers and real is similar, like basically the same thing as numeric. It just has less decimal points. So you will see when we print out the whole table. So, um, yeah. Varchar, you already know what this is, the text. And here we apply another constraint, which is primary key. And primary keys indicate a field which contains only unique values. So here I'm saying that the title column cannot have duplicates and this will be the primary key of the table. Yeah, and here we specify the lengths of the possible, the, uh, wait, the largest possible lengths of characters within the ticker field. Yeah, um, so we created an empty table and uh, a key part here, a SQL query has to end with a semicolon. Yeah. Um, and next we're gonna load the Fortune 500 dataset into the table. So we're gonna right click Fortune 500 and we're gonna select import data. And um, here we will select the file name of, yeah. Of the data set and notice that this uh, data is in a comma separated value file 
CSV. And let me show you what this means. So we're going to select the data set and CSV. And in the options um, sheet, we're going to select header because this data set has headers. And the limit, the limiter is a comma. So I'm going to show you what this data set looks like in a notepad. So this is the data set. And a comma separate value is basically a set of tuples that have values separated through commas. And tuples are basically rows. So this will be our header. This is why we have to um, check the header. And here is each individual row. And each of them is separated through a comma, except when there is a comma within the value. So for it to like stay one whole value, we must put it in quotes so that this comma doesn't separate it, separate Walmart stores and ink, for example. And same here. So yeah, um, I hope this makes sense now. Uh, where did you go to uh, import the data? Import data. Um, you right click the table that you okay. created mm -hmm. and import export data. Utility file not found. Please correct the binary path in the preferences dialog. Oh, yeah. Um, so this is what we discussed. Go to file mm -hmm. preferences. Yep. Um, then go to binary paths. Yeah. And here on the screen, you can you need to select where you downloaded Postgres, then the oh. Postgres. Yeah. And you need to yeah. select the bin, the bin yeah. folder. So in this case, the bin would have to be the same as uh, the advanced search or in this case? Um, what do you mean? <laughs> ah, never mind. Yeah, just um, hold on. Just program files, uh, Postgres, the version, which is 15, and just mm -hmm. click on the bin and select folder. Okay. Yeah, and then you would have, would be able to import the data. Um, so yeah. which files did you import? For the Fortune 500, um, I did import the Fortune 500. Fortune yeah, CSV file. Okay, got it, okay. Do you have it downloaded? Yep. Perfect. Um, yeah, just import that. And here are okay. the settings, which is yep. the second important part. It's a CSV file. And in options, you select headers. The okay. delimiter is a comma. Yeah. Um, and these values also stay the same. Um, mm -hmm. And for null strings, this is... NA, right? Yeah, NA. Sometimes your missing values would be like like this, but in our data set, it's just an A. And you hit OK. All right. Yeah. And yeah, it worked. Hold on. Perfect. So now we can actually print out the whole table to see if we loaded the data correctly. All right. And we did. So is Walmart one on the list? Yeah. Okay, I got the right file. Perfect. Perfect. Okay. Um, so remember when I showed you the example of a simple query? Mm -hmm. So let's just run this one. <clears throat> so basically from the Fortune 500 data, um, table, we select the observations that meet this criteria. So where the sector is technology. And then we print out the title column, the ticker, the revenues, and the sector column to show you that this query um, ran effectively. And we see only companies that are in the technology sector. 
So when we run this, indeed, the, those are all companies in the Fortune 500s uh, that are in the technology sector. So uh, yeah, this is what the query does. And let's take a look at the logical operators for a second. Um, oh yeah, um, I forgot to mention. Um, yeah, all SQL queries fall under the crude operations, which is create, read, update, and delete. So when we created the table, um, it was the create operation. And when we printed out the table, for example, this, these two queries, it will be the read operation. We can also, when you maintain, you can also insert new rows and you can update specific data points and you can also delete observations and tables. So um, here are the logical operators and clauses. So for logical operators, we have and or not. For comparison symbols, we have all of those comparison symbols, uh, which is equal sign, uh, not equal to, um, is both um, exclamation mark uh, and equal sign and um, greater less than greater than. So these are both not equal to. And yeah, then there is uh, less than, less than and equal to greater than and I'm not sure what this is, but I never used it before. Um, yeah, and for comparison keywords, there is between. We can select values that are between um, two data points. So like on a scale uh, also exists in is null. We can select all rows that have null values and also like. And here are the math operators. We can actually um, make computations when we read from the data set. Yeah. And let's switch to Postgres. Um, so I'm going to talk about retrieving and reading data from the Fortune 500 data set. So let's see some examples of queries and what they do to get you more familiar with um, just the syntax. So as we've as we have done before, we um, print out the whole table. We can print out the whole table and just to reference, um, just to see it. Um, yeah, and as you can see here, total rows five hundred out of five hundred. So it is indeed the whole table. But usually you wouldn't really need to do that on a larger data set because you wouldn't um, you wouldn't look through the whole data set. It's it will be too large. Additionally, we can retrieve all rows for specified fields or columns. So if we don't want all of those columns, we can specify that we want the title, the ticker, headquarters, sector, revenues, and profits. And let's run this query to see what it does. And indeed, we can only see six columns now. Great. Cool. Um, Okay, um, cool. And then we we can also find rows that meet conditions. So as we've seen before, we can select uh, observations that meet a specific criteria. So for example, if I want to retrieve um, data on companies that are in the technology sector, I would um, add the where clause to yeah to basically set the column name to the value of technology and yeah um, and I would want to select the title revenues and the sector from those companies that meet this criteria and to run this query um, here are all 
Fortune 500 companies in the technology sector. And there are 43 of them. Additionally, um, we can also combine conditional statements. So using logical operators, we can combine um, two or three or even more conditional statements in the word clause, in the where clause. Uh, so we can find rows that have, for example, we can find rows that have either negative profits or revenues that are less or equal to 10,000, but the revenues column is in million. So um, yeah, the unions matter because uh, this would be 10 billion. Um, yeah, but the units are in millions. So let's run this query. Yeah, and we can see, um, we can see companies that are not really, not either not profitable or don't receive as much revenues as their counterparts. Yeah, it's um, actually a lot of companies within the Fortune 500 have negative profits. Yeah, and um, as I've mentioned, uh, math operators, with them we can compute, make computations on columns. So from the Fortune 500, we can find rows that um, where the profits divided by revenues, so the gross profit margin um, is greater than 10%. And yeah, we can select the title of the company and the this expression, profits divided by revenues as gross profit margin. So also additionally, the as keyword is an alias. So here we want to print out two columns, but we don't want to name our column Profits divided by revenues, we want to name our column gross profit margin. So let's run this query. And here we go. Yeah, um, here it is. So this is the title of the company. Um, and this is the gross profit margin. And we can see all of the companies, all of the 143 companies that have a gross profit margin of over 10%. Uh, next next uh, thing I want to discuss with you is casting. So um, yeah, with data definition language, you would already specify the field types when you create empty tables, but sometimes you get a table and um, like, uh, data type of one field is wrong and you need to cast it to a different data type. So yeah, you can change the displayed data, data type of a column using the cast function. And here is how you would do that. Also, um, the following query um, uses a subquery, which is basically this query. So we take this and its output, which is this table. And we put it into the from statement. So we're basically saying that from this table over here in our data output, we want to select title. And we also want to select gross profit margin, but let's cast it as a real data type because right now it's numeric. Oh, okay. And yeah, um, also when we do a subquery, we need to alias it as well. So let's run this. And as you can see, we have in our data output, we have the same values for gross profit margin, but um, the decimal points are definitely less than what it was before. And it is also possible. So this is. Uh, one way to do it. But casting is also possible with this. So you don't have to write this whole function and alias. You can just do the double quotes and 
these two queries do the same thing. So when we run this, it's like, it won't do much. Yeah, it's the same. Um, yeah, and sometimes. Uh, hi, um, first hi. of all, we're not allowed to be drinking in here or eating. Second of all, we have reservation. Yep. Ends at two. What? What time it ends? Excuse me? All right, um, yeah. So um, next, sometimes you might want to perform computations on existing columns and Postgres has built-in functions for that. So you can select minimum profits. Uh, yeah, let's run this query real quick. So uh, from our Fortune 500 data set, we can, um, We can select the minimum profits as least profits. We can also select the maximum revenues uh, and alias this as most revenues, most revenue. And here you can see the column names. And um, yeah, the average equity has the mean equity among the Fortune 500 companies and also some of the assets. And we can also count the ticker. So yeah, how many companies have a ticker in general? Yeah, um, and one thing with aggregate functions, when we are using them, and additionally, we are using, we're selecting a column which is not being aggregated, we must use the group by statement for the query to run successfully. So if we are selecting, if we want to select minimum average and maximum profits, excuse me, mean, uh, if we want to get the minimum mean and maximum profits, profit values for each sector, uh, we will select the sector, then our uh, aggregate values from the Fortune 500 table, and we will group it by sector. So let's see what this query does. Yeah, it gives you, so it outputs unique sectors within the Fortune 500 companies, which is 21. There are 21 sectors. And for each, you can see the minimum, mean, and maximum profits as numeric data types. Also, Postgres allows you to count observations, order them by most frequent values or in alphabetical order. Um, so yeah, and those are the queries for that. So again, from the Fortune 500 companies, we can um, group all observations by sector um, and we can select the sector and we can count the number of companies in each sector. And then we order it by the frequency descending. So for example, for financials, um, there are 84 companies in the financial sector and 57 companies in the energy sector and so on. And we also can do the same thing for the HQ. So for the headquarters, let's determine, yeah, um, 45 companies in the Fortune 500 are actually located in New York, which is great uh, for any one of you who wants to um, work for those companies. Um, and last thing I want to dis discuss in the basics section is case insensitive search. So if we are dealing with a large data set and we don't really know the data that well, so we don't know if you know the string values are lowercase, uppercase, both, and we don't really know what exactly we're looking for, we can do a case insensitive search. So once again, from Fortune 500 companies, we can 
we will select all rows that meet this condition. So where the company name would be, and then we use this keyword, I like. Um, and we're basically looking for the company name to contain the string bank, but we're saying, okay, I don't care if it's lowercase, uppercase, or both. And I don't care if there are characters before bank or characters after the string bank. I just need to, the bank to be here, <laughs> to be there. And la let's run this query to see what happens. Yeah, um, so for the company name, we have Bank of, of America Corporation, the Bank of New York Mellon, SunTrust Banks. This one has an S on the end because we specified that there may be um, characters after bank. And yeah, the, the M and T Bank Corporation as well. And right now we are done with the basic section. Ooh, here are more um, general purpose functions. So we went over some of them. Additionally, we will post this presentation as well as the SQL um, code to our GitHub. So you could access it today. Okay, and let's dive into special topics. So um, for this, I will be using, to demonstrate our special topics in SQL, I will be using my own data set, which I'm studying for one of my classes. And I'm studying um, IPO data, basically. And it is uh, also attached in the Dropbox folder. Um, so you are welcome to use queries from this part of the workshop for your personal research and data analysis. Yeah, I hope this section will be very useful to some of you. And yeah, let's start with time series. So one topic that I personally found more painless than in Excel, uh, sorry, in SQL then um, using any other software packages is time series and dealing with time series. So for demonstration purposes, first let's create a second table where I'm gonna load my IPO data in. Okay, um, we refresh the tables. Import data. And then we're going to import the IPO data set. Um, OK, the format is comma separate value. And for options, we have header. And yeah, we just, um, it returns the same settings as when you created the first table. So yeah. And the process is successful. So now we have our table and we loaded the data into our table and yeah, um, let's print out the first 10 rows of the table to see if this worked. So here's the data, um, here's the IPO date, meaning the day that the company IPO'd or went public. IPO is, by the way, IPO is initial public, public offering. So when it becomes available to public investors and company name, um, yeah, those are companies that IPO'd. Um, IPO proceeds, those are uh, what the company collected. For example, Core British Financial um, that, well, collected overall one and um, 1,680 million when they IPO'd. So this is in million. And currency industry, oh, okay, excuse me, exchange, and there are also other um, columns. Yeah, and this IPO data set is a time series. A time series is like when there is uh, 
a date or a time. And all rows are dependent on this. And when we created the table, we yeah, we specified that the IPO date is of the date data type, which will be useful because this is what we're going to work with. And the date data type is basically year, month, and day, as you can see here. So um, yeah, let's write the following queries that I'm going to show you. Uh, and let's discuss the results. So um, just to give you some context, this data set, um, the time frame for this data set is from December 2015 to October 2022. So first, let's extract and summarize by month. So we will use the date part function um, that extracts the months from values in the IPO date. So we're going to, um, from the first uh, observation, we're going to extract 10 and then nine and so on. And it stores it as IPO month. So we, through the date part function, we extract the month of the IPO date and we alias it as IPO month. And then we um, also want to retrieve the sum of IPO proceeds. So the total IPO proceeds as total proceeds. And um, as I've mentioned previously, here we have an aggregate function and we also retrieve uh, values that are um that don't use aggregate functions so we need to add the group by statement and once again we're gonna perform this we're gonna retrieve it from the ipo data set not the fortune 500 and we're gonna group it by ipo month which is the one that is not aggregated and we're gonna order it also by ipo month so to see what this query does let's run it and as you can see, so these are the IPO months, one through 12. So this query groups rows by month. Um, and observations from, for example, December 15 and December 2021 would be grouped together in this um, bin, because they're both. Um, both of their months are in December. And in the second column, we can see the total proceeds for each of these months. Yeah, um, next, um, which is also very useful, we can um, do the same thing, um, use the same date part function, but we can um, group it by fiscal quarter, which is very useful in when dealing with a financial data set. So we change month to quarter. Yeah, this is the only thing we change. It's the same query, but um, we're gonna use quarter here and we're gonna alias it as IPO quarter. So this column will be called IPO quarter. And yeah, we're gonna group it by the quarter and order it also by the quarter. So it will be one through four. And here they are. Yeah, and uh, so from this result, we can see that the total proceeds are the highest in the first quarter and the lowest in the third quarter. Um, yeah. Additionally, what we can do is truncate the data to keep larger units, for example, months. And this will be useful when we join the resulting, the result from this query with um, data that contains macroeconomic indices because macroeconomic data is, uh, I'm not sure if you used, ever used Bloomberg, but it is either released each quarter or each month. And yeah, uh, I'm gonna use the one that was released each month 
for the same time frame. And yeah, the date strong function keeps the months in the IPO date, but cuts out, cuts off smaller units. So it cuts off days. So for example, this date, uh, December 2015, 29, will become December 2015, the 1st of December. Um, yeah, and this is the query for that. Um, yeah, we truncate the data. We select month because we want to keep uh, the month unit and the year, but want to cut off the day. And we select it as IPO month. And we also select total proceeds for the companies that went public. And we're gonna run this. And this is the output. So, oh, um, actually, um, this is fine. Uh, this is a timestamp, but maybe we can cast it to date. I'm not sure if this is gonna work, um, but let's do it. No, um, it's not working, okay. Um, yeah. So anyway, let's um, take a minute to discuss the results. So all of the observations for a particular month in a particular year were grouped together and um, yeah, and we can see the sum of all of the proceeds for this particular year. So for example, um, in December, 2015, it was um, 606 million overall. And um, one thing about the IPO data. So the year 2021 was when um, there was an IPO boom and many companies IPO uh, went public and the average proceeds were also very high. So yeah, when we scroll down to 2021, uh, the numbers get larger and larger. Yeah. And in 2022, it's once again slows down because uh, many events happened. Yeah, and um, the final thing about time series, which is not really um, not really time series, but we can zoom in on a year. So we can write a comparison statement in the condition and put it in the where clause. So we can select every row from the IPO data sets where the IPO date is between January 1st, 2021 and December 31st of 2021, of the year 2021. And we can see that there are almost 850 observations. So this is how many companies IPO'd in this year. Next, um, SQL joins. So um, what I wanted to discuss with you is this. There are different types of joins and joins allow us to join two data sets based on um, the column that they have in common. So for the inner join, uh, the inner join returns the intersection of two tables. And one advantage of the inner join is that there are no missing values. The left join keeps all the data from the left table the right join keeps all the data from the right table. Cross join, um, it is a combination of each row of the first table with each row of the second table. So um, the resulting table will be quite large compared to the original ones. And then there is the full join, which keeps all the data in both tables, but the resulting table may have many missing values. Um, yeah, so this is an overview of SQL joins. Personally, my favorites are inner joins because 
there are no missing values. Um, yeah, and one of my favorite topics is time series with joints. So we can do, um, I have another um, data set which contains um, some other some other data, so the ma macroeconomic indices. And we can do an inner join between the IPO data and the uh, percentage changes of the macro indices. So we can create a table with the truncated month. So um, you guys remember this query? We used it in line 166 when we truncated the month. So um, this was the result of this query. And we basically create a table called proceeds each month um, from the same query. So this will be an additional table that will appear with the other tables. So let's run this. And when we refresh the tables, it's gonna Um, yeah, it's going to be there, here, and we can print it out, and it's, uh, oh, and it is the same output, but um, what has changed is that we added an additional column to the statement, and we count not only the total proceeds for each month of each year, but we also count the number of companies that IPO'd during this month. Yeah. Um, and now, yeah, as you can see from those results, the year 2021 uh, experienced a boom in the number of companies going public, and there was a boom in IPO proceeds as well. So yeah, these are relatively high numbers if uh, those are the number of companies that go public each month. Um, yeah, compared to like these numbers in 2020. Um, cool. And personally, I have also um, downloaded some data from Bloomberg. Um, again, I have downloaded macroeconomic indices with the CPI index, the M2, which is money supply and the house price index and the unemployment rate. And then I created percentage changes um, and I saved the file as a CSV. So right now I'm gonna create an empty table and I'm gonna load the data to the table. Oh no. Okay, um, my PG admin shut down. All right, um, yeah, and we could basically join them. So this will be the syntax for um, joining the data. And you can run this on your computer as well. Okay, something went wrong here. Mm. Yeah, I'm not sure what it is though. Okay, now there are four tables. All right. Um, yeah, let's let's proceed. Um, maybe it will crash again, but. I still have the presentation, so we're gonna uh, finish the special topics regardless. So, um, yeah. Um, mm -hmm. So we have the table proceeds each month, and now we created the empty table macro trends. And I can actually import the data there as well. Um, which is this data set. 
but you can define which uh, economic indices make sense to you and which you want to look at. For example, if you want to look at mortgage delinquencies, this is a good index as well. Yeah, okay. Um, all right. Um, so, and now we can join them, actually. Um, yeah, we can join the tables together to see um, the IPO month, um, the proceeds for each month, and the number of companies that IPO during a specific month. And also the percentage changes of economic indices. And once again, we can create a table uh, out of this data output. So we select this query and we add create table, table name alias before that query. Yeah, and now we have the joint table if we ever want to reference it. Yeah. Mm. Okay. Um, next we, so there are also lead and lag columns. And when we have a time series data set, we can create lag and lead columns to compute percentage changes. So um, here how, here's how we would create lag columns for the IPO proceeds data. We would um, select the IPO month and the total proceeds, and we would lag the column. So this is the syntax to lag the column, which is basically you, um, yeah, you lag the values in the same column, total proceeds by one. So yeah, um, I'm gonna run it to show you the output. So here we can see the original table, total proceeds in millions. And here is the lag column. So all the values are lagged by one. See, um, 81, 81, and 600, six. Here's the same value. And yeah. Um, and then we, for the percentage changes, we subtract subtract um, the lag value, this one, from the origin, original value in the column, in the same row. So from total proceeds in millions, and we divide it by um, 100, and we name the column percentage change. Yeah. And as the last step, we order it by IPO month. So it's like in, um, I think ascending order. Yeah. And we can do the same thing, but we can create lead columns. So it's gonna do the same thing, but it's gonna do the opposite thing. It's gonna lead. Um, yeah, let's run this one. Here it is. So once again, um, it is basically, basically lagged in an opposite way. And we can create percentage changes from this. Yes, and um, here is one of my favorite topics in when analyzing financial data. It is anomaly detection. So we look at skewness, kurtosis, and extreme outliers. And high skewness is usually not a big deal, but some invest investors would prefer negative skewness because they would prefer frequent smaller returns, positive returns um, with infrequent larger negative returns. So like losses. So like smaller gains, but many smaller gains and um, very little, very few, but large losses. But it depends on the investor. And um, also high skewness may result in inaccurate model from the data. Kurtosis, um, high kurtosis might indicate an increased risk, risk of 
getting either extremely high or low returns and extreme outliers. So in the past few years, many events have led to the markets behaving abnormally. So at this time, it's uh, unsure what to do with the outliers because while they still might exist as a result of bad data, um, it might be just the uh, overall um, geopolitical events and speculation that kind of result in outliers, in like extreme outliers. And I found a data scientist who um, computes the skewness of a data set. So this would be the code to compute skewness because there is no function in SQL to do that. Um, yeah, but it's not really straightforward. So it involves a lot of, you know, writing your own computations. Um, yeah, if you can compute skewness or like, um, yeah, if you can determine the skewness, using some other tools, they'll be, I guess, mo most efficient. Um, and the same for kurtosis. So this data scientist um, provides a way, a way to do this. But again, it's the query is long. <laughs> so yeah. Um, but what we can discuss is outliers. So Actually, finding outliers is more transparent when you are using SQL because you can determine what you view as outliers. And yeah, it's just, you know exactly what the result is. And when you're using, for example, SQL, it's not really that straightforward. So for our IPO data set, let's um, name the positive outlier. Um, any value that is beyond this point. So it's gonna be <clears throat> one and a half interquartile ranges away from the um, third percentile or the, or the um, 75th percentile. And the negative outlier will be in this range. Yeah, and um, this is the code for it. And I'm gonna explain it to you. And this is the yeah, this is the last thing that we're gonna go over. So we're almost at the Kahoot part. Um, so to separate the outliers from inliers, we shall create bins first. And this topic is a little bit more intermediate. So um, this is just to show what you can do. And yeah, in your future projects, you can reference this work um, if you ever want to you know, um, learn more about SQL and use this in your own data analysis, but this is definitely not basic. Um, yeah, so first we create bins and we call them interquartile range table, so IQR table. And yeah, we create um, bins for the 25th percentile, the 75th percentile, in the interquartile range. And this is only one part of this whole query. So as you can see, there's only one semicolon and it's here. So this is the first part. And once we create those bins, we can move to the main part of the query. And just to show you what this subquery does, um, So this is the subquery and it creates um, percentile, the 25th and the 75th percentile. Um, yeah, and from this table, it selects this value and then um, this value and then the difference between those two, which is the interquartile range. And then with those three bins that we're gonna um, select from, we will um, select the, from the proceeds, proceeds each month table, we will select the IPO month 
and the total IPO proceeds and the number of companies that went public during uh, each of those months. And we will use those bins to determine whether the total proceeds for each month would be positive outliers, negative outliers, or not outliers, so inliers. And um, it will be the last column, which is gonna be called the outlier type. So let's run this query to see what it does. Okay, so um, here we have the IPO month and we have the total proceeds in millions and the number of companies that IPO'd and also the type of the outlier. So as you can see, um, it starts with inliers, but as we move closer to today's date, um, we can see positive outliers. So in the end of 2022, wait, in the end of 2020 and beginning of 2021, there are a lot of positive outliers, meaning companies, there are, uh, Companies that go public receive a lot of money from public investors. And yeah, um, this is what this query does. Um, this is what we discussed. And here I would like to thank you for coming to this workshop. We are done with the special topics part. And yeah. Um, I hope you learned something new. And now I'm gonna let Ari share the screen for you guys to play Kahoot. Also, one key thing, um, when you register, make sure to put your name as it appears here in this uh, Zoom session so that we know uh, who to give the money to. Ari, are you ready? Okay, um, thank you so much for uh, the students that stayed with us. Yeah. I will be sharing my screen soon. Mm -hmm. Oh, and yeah, thank you for pasting the code in the chat. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and of course you can get the recording later. So this session will be recorded. It will be uploaded to our YouTube channel and we'll paste the link in our Discord chat. So yeah. Um, how is everyone doing? Oh, there you have the the, the music. I don't um, know if you can um, hear it. Yeah, hold on. Okay, let me. Yeah, just share your screen. Share. Cool. You guys uh, see that? <laughs> Yeah, if you guys are not on your phone, if you're on your laptop, please pull up your phones and let's start playing. Okay. All right, I need everyone to be registering right now. All right, we have one. Mm -hmm. Can you guys hear the sound? No. I think you forgot to share the sound. Oh man, we're missing out. <laughs> yeah, just click the link that Ari pasted in the chat if you um, are able to. If you are on your phone, so just click the link. Can you guys hear it now? Yes, yes. Now you got it. Oh man, that song brings back memories. <laughs>
yeah um are we good to start um well so i'm just gonna paste the link and whoever joins later okay. yeah all right everyone pay attention yeah we have the fastest uh, eight players yeah the fastest you um answer the more points you get And the key thing here is executed by the database management systems. Look at the so, acronym. Hmm. It is the from statement. Um, the database management systems navigates to um, the table first, and then it's selects um, the columns. But yeah, uh, the select statement would come first when we write the query. So next question. Okay. All right, Jose, good job. And Michael. Look at the acronyms. Okay. Yeah. Mm, nice. Remember zip codes. Yeah, some zip codes might have a zero at the beginning, so this is a trick question. Which data type for zip codes? Okay, good job. Majority got it correct. Cool. Oh, okay. Some comp competition going on. Comparison. Mm -hmm. Right? Look at the, um, just English, honestly. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> Only one person. All right. It is between. I mean, I do see what's going on because for Python, it N and OR. Yeah. Yeah. What is between? Okay. Okay. She. Okay. Good job. Good job. So, is casting only possible with the cast function, or are there some other ways? Is it only possible? Okay, good Thanks. job. Good job. Right. The combine. Oh, it's where we combine two or more conditional statements within the where statement with the use of logical operators. Okay, moving on. <laughs> mm. 
It's not a cra- characteristic. Mm-hmm. Okay. Good job. Good yeah. job. Uh, Postgres is open source. It's not proprietary. Okay. Perfect. For this one, I gave more time because there's more reading involved. Yeah. So take your time to read. There's more time. Perfect. Good job. <laughs> Good job. SQL does indeed stand for Structured Query Language. Okay, next. Summary function to get the total amount. Total amount. Summary. (laughs) Okay, okay. Nice. Oh, wow, Bobby. Good job. He's on fire. Mm-hmm. <laughs> Remember that I, I said um, hint in the chat when we were talking about it? Oh, no. Okay. Uh, yeah, case insensitive search. Perfect. Yeah. Okay, majority got it. Mm-hmm. Let's see the results. Oh, okay. Nice. Okay. We have another person in the top three. Yep. Last question. Select red, select red. Yeah, the fastest you can. <laughs> Yay. <laughs> All right. Um, who are the winners? Next. Yep. Um, we're gonna need to take your emails, Gia. Okay, yeah. third place. Bobby. Okay, good job. Daria. Okay. Good job. Good job. Nice. The three per- people. Um, no, not your email. <laughs> um, oh, are you? Are you Bobby? Wait. Yeah, I use Bobby as a screen name. Are you sure? Um, hmm, are you sure? Well, this is what my laptop's logged in as. Okay. 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 All right. Um, and Gia is okay. Wait. Nice. Okay, I'm gonna copy your emails. Daria, can you please paste? Okay. I'm gonna copy your emails to the uh, treasury, and I'm gonna. Uh, advise you on the next steps. Hmm. Sorry. Y'all thought so I was using what's someone gonna, else's huh? laptop. <laughs> Sorry. So what's going to happen is um, our treasury team is going to send you an email and it would request you to share your the picture of your student ID. And the faster you share it with them via email, you're probably, Jeffrey will probably reach out to you today or tomorrow. And the faster you send it, um, yeah, the faster you receive your money. So we, we, we expect to send the gift cards this week. Um, yeah, that's it. Thank you everyone for participating. I got the emails of the winners. I hope it was a fun session and I'll see you all around campus and maybe even in the following AIS events. Yeah, we have general interest meeting second, right? The second one. Yeah. Hey, which part of campus you guys holding it? Uh, I think it's the fourth fourth floor. Oh yeah. Let me look. Yeah, that's not a big flight of stairs. <laughs> no. <laughs> oh man, 
And Ari, remember that time where our math class was on the 11th or 10th floor? Oh, yeah, for 11th. calculus. Yeah. Oh, my gosh. Calculus. It was a whole trip. Yes. Yes, it was. Yeah. Thank you, everyone, for participating. We will share the recording and the GitHub link, link so you can go over it again. Thanks for hosting the yeah. session. Thank okay, you. That, that's... um. Yeah, the room for we'll be at. 175. Yeah. Thanks, everyone. Have a nice day. Bye. Take care.